Right then. Now, depending on wherever you look, really, anywhere across Africa, it's becoming increasingly clear that there is a digital finance revolution that's in full swing. Financial tech has affected just about every aspect of banking, insurance, uh, and that covers everyone from both the companies themselves down to regulators, investment management, and of course, as you would know if you're a regular viewer of this program, cryptocurrencies. Now, many of these changes have been driven in part by the application of machine learning, uh, which is, again, an outgrowth of data analytics. In this revolution, of course, there will be winners and there are losers, but it's no longer an option for any financial institution to essentially stay on the sidelines. So the question is, who wins and how? But of course, who are the losers in this entire race? So let's dig deeper into this and emerging issues in financial inclusion. David Cracknell is a global technical director at Microsave. He's been here before, bit of a regular at the program at this rate. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So then, um, as we get deeper and deeper into these things, um, there's a lot more data that's being gathered, right, across Sub-Saharan Africa from millions and millions of clients. We're applying a lot more algorithms to the market, but then that raises the other side of the equation that we haven't really covered yet. Who holds the data? How secure is it? And how do we prevent programmers from bringing their biases into the code they write that, at this point, millions of people rely on? Okay, well, I think that algorithms, as you, as you talked about, are being used increasingly for taking financial decisions um, in terms of the programs that the banks use to determine your credit worthiness, for example. But at the moment, these are relatively simplistic. Mm -hmm. So, for example, on many of these small loans that you have, um, the algorithms being used principally are looking at your repayment history. Mm -hmm. Have you repaid well? It's one of the reasons that if you go for one of these small loans on your mobile phone, it starts off really small and it graduates. Yeah. So it's still using very simple data. Mm. Um, but one of the problems that you've got is that you can then use data from multiple sources. So have you given your permission for this data on you to be used? Yeah, because one of the things that comes to mind is if, like to use a Kenyan example, um, you can use data points from my repayment on my power bills, my repayment on water bills, for instance, previous loans, and all of this comes together to be aggregated into a picture of my risk. But where does my consent come in? Absolutely. And very often, you'll find that if you're doing this over your mobile phone, there's a permission that you've given in downloading the app mm -hmm. for data to be gathered on you. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems that I've got, and one of the things I think regulators need to look at, is this issue of consent and informed consent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite important. So consumer protection and information disclosure is quite important. Um, right. So for me, one of the issues also is obviously security of data. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, we've got the cloud-based data now, and that is actually much more secure than data on a local server. Mm -hmm. And there's no incident so far where, say for example, we've had a massive breach, perhaps on the scale of like say Target in the United States, that has affected any of these uh, mobile phone service providers or mobile money service providers, at least within Africa, has there? Um, I think there have been um, flaws inside the mobile money provider mm -hmm. which have lost serious money. Mm -hmm. Uh, there have been cases in, M in Uganda with MTN mm. that are recorded uh, where, where there has been significant loss, but that's not been through uh, data breach, that's been through fraud. Right. Um, based on the work you've done there, because you, you cover a broad range of economies, Asia, Africa, and so on and so forth, are we seeing financial service providers, especially on the mobile side, um, increasingly saying, okay, yes, there may not be laws in place, compelling us to protect our clients' data uh, or compelling us to make uh, to, to, to get their informed consent. But are we seeing financial services providers now saying, okay, you know what, we have to get ahead of this anyway because we'll get there somehow, so we have to invest in this right now? I think it's very much the case that financial service providers are having to invest. And the more we go digital, mm -hmm. the more they're having to invest. Mm -hmm. IBM, every year, do a survey of, of a number of countries and they look at the cost of data breach. Yeah. And a typical data breach per record is now costing $141. Mm -hmm. A typical data breach has 24,000 records that are breached. That's an average. That's $3.3 million. Mm -hmm. In the financial sector, 
you can probably double that for a data breach in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. So you're talking then of a serious data breach, an average data breach, costing something like $7 million. And that's just the, f the numerical cost. It doesn't go into the opportunity costs involved in having your personal information Completely. out there. So one of the things is banks, yes, they need to invest heavily in data security. And you've seen that in some of the leading players. Mm -hmm. Equity have a tier four data center, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, what else would you be doing? You would be uh, encrypting data. You would be, in some cases, putting it on the cloud. Mm -hmm. You would be doing a lot of things on data analytics, on your own data, mm -hmm. to, to ensure that uh, fraud isn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, velocity mapping is, is one technique. They look at the data flow. And if something changes, it's an indication that something may be wrong. And of course, a bit of penetration testing on your networks as well. Completely. Um, one, one last question for you, though. Things like um, agent banking, mobile money services, because looking at the, the last uh, global financial inclusion index from the World Bank, a big chunk of the financial inclusion that we've seen across sub-Saharan Africa has come through these kind of services. But we've seen over the last couple of years that governments are looking at this and saying, oh, that's an interesting revenue stream I can tap into. So we'll levy a transaction on the fees for moving money back and forth. We'll levy a transaction uh, on the amount of money that you're moving back and forth. Based on the data that you've seen so far, how elastic is subscription to these services and their use in response to these levies? Well, I think that a levy based on a fee that you're being charged doesn't change very much because if you're being charged, let's say, 33 shillings mm -hmm. uh, for a transaction on M-Pesa mm -hmm. and M-Pesa is being charged a 10% uh, excise tax, mm -hmm. that's three shillings. It can get absorbed into the fee. Mm -hmm. The one that has me more concerned is uh, the potential for a transactions tax on the value of the transactions. And yes. This is being proposed in Uganda uh, under changes to the uh, Excise Act, yeah. where 1% of the transaction value yes. will be taxed. And I think that has the potential for significant impact. Mm. So essentially that would act as a deterrent, as it were, from people to actually use this service a lot more. I think so. Mm. I think so. But strangely enough, that's a mobile money tax. That mm. doesn't apply to agent banking. Mm. Ah, differentiation indeed. We'll leave it there for the time being. David, as always, pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much.